Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, for today, I'll be talking about uh, chapters, lesson three. Okay. So uh, let me just give you a brief uh, sort of like where, where I started. So uh, you'll be seeing a paper space um, uh, version of the note of the of the notes um paper space is quite nice because they actually have a fast ai implementation like you could deploy the the notebook directly or at least uh you could use their service and it has a part that has uh, fast ai built in already as opposed to google collab where you have to uh where you have to literally go through these lines of code setting up and installing fastbook uh at the beginning and then you also have to give google drive the rights to or at least the rights to enter your storage uh including your photos and stuff like that so uh depends on your level of comfort and then uh i've also encountered that when you use the when you use Google Colab, Colab a bit too much, which I did this time because I'm doing the prep for, for this week, uh, I ran out of uh, computing time and then it starts to ask for money. Uh, thankfully, paper space could, could work, but sometimes the free machines are not very available. So just FYI, okay, there. Uh, the nice thing about paper space is that you just have to do from fastbook import star and then things are doing you, you're 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 good to go you don't have to go through uh pip install anymore okay um so uh, real again, quick uh you know i used uh, uh paper space a little bit a couple years ago how long did it take you to get set up? Was it was it pretty streamlined? I haven't played with yeah, it recently. Exactly very, very streamlined, like in a mint. So earlier I stopped the machine because it's it, it you could only use it in inter intervals of one hour at least the way it was set up here I used the defaults I didn't tinker with it at all and I clicked on start machine and after a minute or so it was run up and running already so That's great it's not so bad yeah just Thanks. FYI also the for paper space you have like an hour uh. It, you're given an hour to do your work somehow. Uh, I didn't tinker further because it was enough for me, uh, and it will auto. It will give you a reminder that an hour is about about to be over. Okay. For Google Colab, you you basically you're unaware, <laughs> and then and then your resources are gone in a, in a moment. <laughs> there. Uh, so that's it. That's the uh, paper space or Google Colab uh, side of things. Uh, I didn't. I didn't emphasize. Uh, sorry, I I don't do a lot of Python. So I only started learning a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but it was for symbolic Python. So it was like I didn't go through main Python. Just do the stuff that I I need to do for SimPy because I needed to teach a course that uses uh symbolic Python to do some calculus, something, something to that effect. Okay. So a lot of the stuff that I there's a lot of Python that I don't know. Okay. And here in the course, you're you're not learning Python here. You're only kind of getting a sense of how Python is going to be used, but ultimately you are using a canned uh for lack of a for lack of a better description, a canned set of commands, so to mm -hmm. speak. Okay, so let me just give you a, a broad overview. Uh, so we're going to do the draw two circles and then uh, draw the rest of the damn owl uh, stuff. So the the whole game. So the whole game is that uh, we're using this uh, MNIST sample. It's a sample that is filled with images of threes and sevens. And the point of, at least from the book, from the book, if if you follow the book, you're supposed to uh, build a digit classifier. Is it a three or is it a seven? That's the, that's the bottom line. And the workflow is that, the workflow is first create the data, you know, create the data set. That's the first part. Create the data set and then implement your learner. Your learner. So for creating the data set, 
you have to point to the URLs for the location of MNIST sample. And then you need to have a way to uh, understand the paths of uh, the locations of the images. Okay, so you have to get get acquainted with this because this turns out to be important uh, in terms of how to load things. Um, and then afterwards, put them into a data structure that is called a tensor. Okay, and then afterwards, uh, stack all of these images together, convert them into matrices, you know, and every entry of that matrix is some sort of a pixel density. Okay. And then once you have the once you put that in this tensor format, uh, you have to and sorry once you have those numerical representations, uh, you put them into a data in, you put them into a spreadsheet of sorts. Okay, so essentially what you do is, uh, the matrix that the so matrix the numerical representation of that image is sort of like put into a line uh, as a uh, sorry put into a row okay and that would be the numbers representing the pixel density and then you have as part of the last entry a y value which represents the whether the image is a three or a seven so you have labels for for the for the data that you have okay so i put all of the I put all of the commands together. One of the, I, I would say one of the, I don't know if it's frustrating for some, uh, but for me it was frustrating because uh, uh, you actually have, when you, the, the, the lesson starts with you going th under the hood first. Okay? Then afterwards you see the real thing. And, um, and it can get, um, how should I put it? It can get overwhelming in the sense that you don't know which part is really needed for the code. So you have to really spend time to make sure that you, you check off the parts of the notebook that are really important for a particular task and uh, and not be detracted by the uh, digging around so that you're un you'll be able to understand the underlying uh, concept, so to speak. So there's a the lesson mixes the code that is used to learn things and the code that is used to actually Im implement things. And uh, there's also there's a difference between those two, at least with respect to the chapter. Okay, so essentially this is what the workflow is all about. Okay, and uh, there's a discussion. For for I don't know I don't know for for you the viewer, uh you might find it weird that there would be a divided by two hundred fifty five somewhere and this is really something related to the image uh the image itself so when you when you transform the image into a numerical representation and here we're talking about grayscale images, uh zero represents uh white. Uh, and then 255 represents black. So the, the the more the number is close to 255, there's there are more pixels, there are more black pixels there. Okay. So and then they have to convert it into sort of like a, den a density of sorts. So they divide it by 255. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's uh you're right. But you want to get it between zero and one. Um and I know like I mean it was even mentioned in in, in the video lesson, right? If you have bunch of variables on a different scale you want to kind of get them to be comparable but here everything's going to be between zero well e even if you had left it it would still be between what uh zero and 255 or whatever yeah um but you know i think as part of the process don't the parameters get randomly initiated generally between i don't know zero and one or something like that a small number so i think there's something about faster convergence um, right by scaling it. I think that's that's the idea, uh, but feel free uh, group to uh, correct me on that. Yeah, so there's a part of the initialization where they get random numbers from a standard normal, I think it, at, at, at least, let me see. Well, it's hidden in the- how Yeah, should I put it? it's abstracted away, we don't see it. We don't see it, but in the implementation that you see when you, when they dig under the hood is that they, 
get random numbers from a standard normal and then it's not really yeah. between zero and one per se. Right, but just small numbers, right? Small I think numbers. there's exactly there's, there's some properties, faster convergence or something like that. Um, why, why you'd want to have small numbers overall in your variables. Yeah. And I think that's that's kind of the, that's right. the yeah. primary reason behind it, right? That's right. In the video, there is also discussion that you want to put those very those x's within in the same magnitude somehow, right? So yeah, yeah. So you can you... standard standardize that using like a standard normal or yeah. you know just right. There's other other ways you can do it, but you got to normalize it so it's a small number. That's right. Sorry, you were you wanted to say something? I think. Oh yeah, the um. The feature normalization with the scales, yeah, is related to um, the gradient magnitudes as well. I guess for the output, though, since there's in this case, there's only one output, it might just yeah be about um, the generalization of the workflow, including yeah the initialization and if you're using pre-trained models. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, yeah. So that's the, yeah. I, I think when you use Optim in R or Optim X in R, you would always, uh, one of the advice is to, let's say when, when you want to start with some parameters or DC, they, they, they do have a measure of the sizing of the parameters. Uh, and when your X's have different scales, the optimizer tends to choke a bit. So you have to adjust things a bit so that, you know, things will not uh, go to non-convergence or st stuff, something related to Aaron was saying. Yeah. And then, and then afterwards, you basically have to create the training data set and the, val and the validation data set or the testing data set basically following the same uh uh same set of commands uh and uh, and one thing to pay attention to if you're going to use this for your own hobby is that uh is that you have to be you have to be careful about this part because when you don't have a grayscale image then this part these parts have to be modified or these have to think a bit harder about uh, about these parts. The other thing is that the images have to have the same size. Like it, here, you have twenty eight by twenty eight. So I don't know if I don't know if you have varying images. Let's say for a different project, and you want to transport the or this use this code directly on that. I don't know how how things will be affected, but at least I felt that this was the crucial part here. And then the other crucial part is to make sure that you actually have the labels, uh, you, you that the data that you prepared, you actually know that you don't, you actually know their Y value, right? So that's that's the thing to pay attention for this workflow for the data. Okay. And then here we draw the the damn owl. So so the whole game is really that. Uh, you start from the prepared data set, which is the draw two circles part, and then you use this data loader so that you have this batching. Okay, you have to do some batches. This batch, this batching part is really for the is really for the gradient descent descent part. Okay, so it wasn't explained very well in the lesson, but uh, I wondered about the I thought about. What does stochastic mean in graded in stochastic graded descent? And if you look at the lesson, they really didn't discuss that part. They talked about graded descent, but not uh, why it's called stochastic graded descent. And uh, instead, they talk about doing batches. Uh, and the argument is that you don't want to you don't want to use the entire data set to calculate a gradient because of storage reasons. So, so that's where they were coming from. But I think the stochastic is coming from the fact that you also have this, this batches and it's a random sample from, from the data. Uh, however, this random sampling was, was done. So we, we don't know, but it was, there was a random sampling that was done. Okay. And I, think, I feel like I remember like mm -hmm. there's, there's mini batch, 
yes. the gradient descent and then there's stochastic gradient descent. And I thought is stochastic gradient descent when you're just looking at one instance at a time or I, I again, it, maybe it doesn't really matter, but I, I think the terms just kind of get thrown around loosely, but I thought I remember reading something about that. Yeah, stochastic gradient descent uses several at a time, a batch. Several at a time, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, What's stochastic Eric, about is it uses a random set of them. <laughs> sure, sure, yep. Or random shuffles them and then takes sets of them. Yep, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Aaron, you you you, you exactly uh, what what you said earlier about terms being thrown around. That that is sense. That's how I felt as well with the lesson. Yeah, especially when they talk about activations and activation functions. So that's also something that might be a bit jarring uh, for some. Yeah, and so you set up this mini batch of stuff, and then you start with a simple model with. Uh, via uh, using an n dot linear okay so essentially an n dot linear is like doing uh so these these are all linear functions that are involved here and then uh you experiment away by just adjusting how long you want to do the learning and this learning rate that is involved with the that is involved in the in the stochastic gradient descent part okay okay and to be able to run the to be able to run this uh code here which is the the whole game you have the data loader and then you have this learner part the learner part you have to pass the data you have to pass the data set you have to pass uh uh this n n dot linear you also have to pass uh, what's the optimization function that you're going to be using. And then there's the book makes a very nice, has a very nice discussion about uh, the distinction between a loss function and a, and a metric. So I, I also invite you to have a look at that. Okay. Uh, but you have to pass functions for these two. And this part is where the user has to give the input. Okay. So the user has to design a loss function and the user has to design uh, a metric. And then afterwards, uh, once once you have that, uh, you just run learn.fit and according to a learning rate, which is LR, and then uh, the 10 here is the, uh, the epoch, the number of epochs, okay? And then, this is just a sing, I think a single layer, a single layer uh, neural network. If you want a multi-layer neural network, then you just have to change this part. That's it. Okay. And the idea is to change it to something like simple underscore net, or in chapter one, they called it ResNet 18 or ResNet 34. But in this situation, in in chapter, sorry, in lesson three, they uh they focused on simple net so it's a three layer network and um they didn't really discuss as clearly why this became 30 instead of one before okay so one before and then suddenly it became 30 and then there's now output so activations yeah that's a two layer with yeah. one activation oh sorry and the 30 is the output. So that's the input dimension and output dimension. That's right. Yeah. There's, there's 30 units hidden in the hidden layer, as it were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then so, the 30 gets transformed to one. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah. So that activation. So uh, this is called the activation function. This is the nonlinearity that is uh, that is emphasized at the end of the uh, of the lesson. Okay, and uh, at some point they also talk about activation as a set of numbers. So I think it's at the end. Yeah, numbers that are calculated both by linear and nonlinear layers. So the, those two things, yeah. Yeah, that that might be confusing for some. Yeah, there. So I think the key thing is the activation isn't doesn't have anything learned in it. It's just mm. a deterministic transformation. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. There. 
So that's uh that's essentially the whole uh the whole game uh so to speak and uh things are working very well uh in this um uh, is it the three or is it a seven example yeah here's now, a question for you andrew i uh yeah. didn't run through the, the the book chapter code did you have to modify anything in there because I, I know the book's you know a few years old at this point and i don't know if it's always being kept up to date just just curious yeah, there, there's nothing to modify per se, but if you want to organize your notes or, you know, you want to really separate the part that is about the whole game, then you have to decide which parts you have to, to put in. But the only, if, if you're going to see any differences, okay, between the book and what you're going to be doing, uh, it might be that it might be the output that would be different. So for example, the, the paths, okay? When you run it, it would look something different, but ultimately the the next lines of codes that you're gonna run are gonna work still. Mm -hmm. And then of course, for the stochastic parts, you'll, you'll be expecting something different, right? Yeah, but all of the code seems to be working uh, on the spot, yeah. there and then and then that's it that's the that's uh the implementation of a uh deep or these a neural network uh in this in this case and then once you see that whole game uh see what it looks like uh you could go under the hood and then really dig one by one each line okay uh, I don't know if that would work better, but uh, for me, I started reading the chapter and the, and I had to read the chapter probably four times or so just to, uh, maybe because I was also preparing for this. So that's why I read it more. Uh, but uh, it depends on your style now, but when, when I, when I, when I read it the first time, it starting with under the hood, I think didn't work well for me uh because you kind of will be tempted to try to understand the codes that were used and not necessarily along with the ideas uh but then again you will not be using that same code uh for the actual thing so i don't know if if, if the payoff is uh the, i guess there's a payoff in terms of someone who doesn't know python very well they could pick up something from it yeah. So if you're a new user of Python, you'll 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 encounter like index in the indexing that starts at zero, let's say. Uh or when when you're let's say you're an R user and you see something like one one colon ten, you will expect something like one to ten, but then here here it would be one to nine in Python. You know, th those kinds of things might be uh 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 might not might, might be jarring at first but i think going through that might help yeah when you flesh when you try going through the fleshing out of the parts uh you also have to separate the motivation uh at the beginning because the beginning part is not the is not the way things are going to go so essentially the i you go back to the problem the problem is how do you differentiate between two digits in the best way possible? So when you when you do this, there are actually two ways that were offered in the chapter. One is to define what is pixel similarity and then form use that as a way to differentiate between digits. So in in that part of the book, okay, there's a discussion about how a particular image is different from an ideal version of what that digit looks like, okay? And you have to measure a distance between those two somehow, and then use that as a way to differentiate uh, between di digits. The other approach, which is the neural network approach, is let's get rid of pixel similarity. In instead, what you're gonna do is, uh, think of these images as matrices 
just like before, uh, but this time attach weights to each pixel and then let the machine do the learning for you in some way. So that's the, that's really uh, a very different way of thinking about the, thinking about the problem of differentiating between two digits in the best way possible. Yeah. And then from the Python side, you get to learn tensors versus arrays, uh, list comprehension, calculations via broadcasting. Uh, and you'll also encounter something like mean, the, the function mean, where you sometimes see mean with just a parentheses and then mean with mean zero inside as an argument. And sometimes you also see mean with the with an input with a tuple minus one minus two. So uh, if you're coming in first time Python user, have to learn uh, what those means, what, what those commands uh, mean at some point. Yeah. There. And then finally, they go through the actual construction of the learner. Yeah, like how exactly predictions are going to be made, uh, how to do how how to def how to best think of a loss function and how to separate that from a metric, and then what's the, what are the ideas behind gradient descent, uh, and why there's a element of arbit arbitrariness involved in in choosing the learning rate, and you have to you have to find a sweet spot somehow. Uh, they haven't discussed all of the details as to how to find the sweet spot. You have to do some experimentation. And uh, one of the probably very interesting um, demonstrations is the part about where they want to fit a quadratic function. Okay. They wanted to fit a quadratic function for this one. And if you try the under the hood explanation of the of how to of of this um gradient descent if you apply gradient descent here you actually will never get you will never get the best fitting quadratic function yeah so that's something that that might feel jarring as well for someone with a statistics background because i will just do if you do lm speed so here the y is speed and then x is time. So you just do LM speed time and then square of time. And then when you look at the scatter plot and then plot the the resulting prediction, it fits very well. Like literally the, the best fitting quadratic function would, would essentially be around this blue curve here. But if you do gradient descent, no matter how long or no matter how many epochs you've used, and uh, no matter are these, when I try different learning rates, let me put it that way, uh, you will have a hard time uh, getting the best fitting quadratic function. The The best one would, would roughly look like the fourth figure that you see here. Okay? And if you use a very small learning rate, sometimes uh, the, red, the reds here will just disappear. Simply they, they fall away and then fall out of the figure, yeah. There, and then uh, the remaining, I, I, I also try to do, you know, repeat the process for uh, doing this, is it a three or a seven, but this time using the full data set. So you basically go through the same uh, workflow as before, and you could try these two different tasks. Uh, for example, is it a six or an, eight, or an eight? If you try this, the defaults that you see in the in the notebook uh, will not work very well as far as I remember. You have to adjust the learning rate a bit, and then you'll do very well. But if you try that same set of tricks for five or six, uh, I was only able to get about 50% accuracy, I think. And as the epochs uh, pass by, uh, the accuracy is getting smaller and smaller. So so I, I stopped experimenting after a while because I had other things to do as well. But in case you're interested, uh, 
you just have to change the source of the URLs and then change the, once you have the, the new set of URLs instead of urls.mnist sample, you just use mnist and uh, magically it actually works. So, and then you point to the directory six and eight, and then you could you could go through this classification, digit classifier for six and eight in pretty much the same way uh, as described in the chapter. Yeah. And once you have that, you just implement this learner, adjust things here and there, and that should be okay uh, for six and eight, but for five or six, it's not very okay. So you might want to experiment with the number of output activations. Uh, you might want to add more layers. Uh, you might want to experiment with the learning rate, but essentially this is the, uh, this is really the whole, the whole game. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think that's, that's it from, from, I think that's it from my end. Yeah. Uh, if you, if there are things you want to discuss, uh, Please feel free. You know, but uh, I think that's about it for from my end. I I didn't want to repeat what you see in the in the video uh, anymore. In the video, the in in the video, I I listened to it at the uh, last. I read first, then listened to the to the video. Uh, the codes in the video are a little bit different from uh, from the book. Uh, but the nice thing about the video is that you could actually literally implement a neural network using Excel. So that was also a very nice uh, uh, thing mm -hmm. that they've done. But it's a linear regression. It's a linear regression problem rather than a, a classification uh, problem there. That's it from my end. Yeah, what, what kind of... Uh... Accuracy were you getting with your threes and sevens? You said you're getting fifty percent with the what the sixes and the eights or whatever. For fives and six, fives and sixes, uh, about fifty percent. If I use default, six. you know. Okay. Yeah. 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 I guess you know that's we're going to be going over this in later weeks, but we're just using a basic perceptron, right? Feed forward network, and since this is really a computer vision problem, you'd want to use a convolutional neural net mm. i think we're just we, we kind of previewed that right in the first week uh with the with mm -hmm. the vision dot learner or whatever kind of just did that for you so i didn't i didn't go through the the, the book example for for the ms data set but that would be interesting to see how you know how much better you do with the cnn yeah so uh, i think in that situation you just have to change I, i'm not sure if i could just change this to restnet 18 and see what happens yeah, oh, yeah yeah that's right well that yeah do the, the transfer learning approach right yeah. yeah that would that would probably be uh probably yeah. be much better so I, I i didn't go through that anymore so uh, um, yeah yeah i think the owl thing i think the hard part is actually figuring out like the startup like what pencil do I need? Like setting up the to run this fast AI thing. <laughs> That's been it's not the draw it's not going from the circles to the owls. It's actually how do I draw a circle? <laughs> so you, you do pick up a pick up a pencil. <laughs> yeah. Pick up a pencil and draw the... <laughs> I, I actually that if I under if I understood where you, you're coming from uh it's uh it's really about the the Im how you how you have how you set up the starting point which is those those data sets right mm -hmm. the data sets are mm -hmm. the the hard part here actually okay uh yeah and here... even the software like i mean we've had how many different kaggle paper space yeah. uh, many different ways to implement it <laughs> that's right yeah there so anything else you wanted to, to talk about to discuss but if you I felt thought the excel thing was interesting but i also felt like it was a hack like he just called the optimizer so 
I think it would have been <laughs> the same if he just called the optimizer in Python. Yeah. It, it, it would be. In fact, I, I actually did that for fun. I I did it as with pandas instead of Excel, just reproduce what he did. There yeah. Was the Titanic thing. He used, I used the SciPy's optimizer, which, you know, and it works fine. Yeah. Nice. I mean, so another thing I want to point out, by the way, chapter four, uh, I'm glad you did this, by the way. I don't think he actually comes back to this 3 7 thing in the, as far as I know, in the video lectures and the lessons. But he does come back to chapter four, at least in the lesson five, refers to chapter four. So I think in lesson five, which is, what's it called? Like from the scratch model. And when he says from scratch, he doesn't mean like from, you know, I thought he means using PyTorch, not using fast AI. We will see more of this again, like how you build up a model with uh, neuron, with uh, PyTorches and then neural network layers and sequentials and whatnot. Um, mm. So if you did, I guess my point is if you went through the whole chapter, uh, you won't have to go through it again in chapter five. You know, it's lesson five because you've already covered that. And then when you get to lesson five, it'll be a little bit easier to going, I hope. Mm. Uh, so yeah. I have, lesson I have, four is the next one. That one is actually complete departure and goes off in a hugging face land. So <laughs> yeah, that was kind of the end of the video uh, where he's like, hey, go ahead and explore and yeah, use use hugging face. I I uh, did I ran out of time. I did. Really I haven't done that yet either. I figured I'll wait till I get back from my vacation, then it'll be more fresh in my mind when I. Because that's my my week is uh, the NLP week, so better oh, to have nice. fresh in my mind. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So for future presenters, yeah, I was noticing. Sounds like y'all are on top of it, but I was noticing that um, the book, it the videos don't go in necessarily the order of the book chapters no um, no and even the under the hood stuff could be slightly different so mm -hmm. that's something to pay attention to i don't know so so for me i i i pref for some reason i prefer reading the book directly uh before watching the video uh it, it it forces a discipline somehow if you if you if you if you start reading from the book the video is nice for you to feel good that that you can do it i think that's that's one of the functions of the video that you you may not know all of the details but it makes you it lulls not lulls you into a false sense of security, but rather it lulls you into feeling that, ah, yes, I could, I could do this and I could understand this. Yeah. So that's the main purpose of that video. Yeah. <laughs> you can, you can yeah. actually feel that. <laughs> so, yeah. So for the next lesson, I have to think a little bit about it too, because I know in the book, chapter, he refers to chapter 10. Well, chapter 10, it goes in there, RNNs. And I think it's just going to be a little bit like too high, mm. too low level. We haven't actually done the PyTorch stuff yet. So talking about RNNs, we haven't done anything else, maybe a little hard. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the chapter to see if it really influences an RNN or just like pulls one out. Um, but, uh, so anyway, I would probably focus more on the video for next week is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. It looks like that. there's a lot of um, data cleaning in chapter 10 in the beginning. Yes. So that might be useful. Text pre-processing is a whole section. Yeah, yes. you're right. No, I, I think now I look at it, I don't actually see any Python code doing RNNs. So I don't know why you mentioned the word <laughs> RNN at the beginning. Deep dive RNNs and there's like, there's no dive. So so essentially, if you look at chapter 10, uh, this is the part. That's the key part. And then you have just to have to trace all of these things. Oh, you know what? You're right. I do remember now, I, I watched the beginning of that video. He does say like the book uses fast AI. And the video uses hugging face, I think. Is that what happened? I don't know. I remember that correctly. Hmm. Yeah. Um, huh. hmm. Yeah, because he uses language model learner. Yeah, so it's probably, I take it back. I think it is worth doing both. I guess there's a high enough level that it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. So for me, I read the chapter from, from <laughs> the beginning to the end. And then the other way is to read it from the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> read it backwards. 
The other thing yeah. I thought was interesting in the lesson for this week is he did spend a little bit of time in that universal function approximation theorem or whatever. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. a lot of words. Is that what it's actually called? But I need a shorter name for that. But in any event, he spent some time in that, which is actually kind of a cool result. Um, it's both a cool result and it's kind of nice that you can approximate any function with a single hidden layer. Uh, also, I guess it's interesting to kind of set back neural networks for a while because everybody got so obsessed with that, they never realized how important multiple layers could be. Um, even though you don't technically mm -hmm. need them because you can approximate anything with a single layer, it's just completely impossible to train and not very efficient to use only a single layer. Uh, that's what was discovered later, I guess. But um, so it's where I posted on the Slack, um, like this cool little, um, at, did anyone play with that? The TensorFlow playground mm -hmm. thing. It's kind of fun. Uh, two uh, little vision, a very simple uh, neural network that you can mess around with different layers and, and, and see how well it can approximate different like classification or regression things. Um, but there's also, if you search on YouTube for universal function approximation network, whatever, there's a like red, three, blue, one, green, whatever it is. He's got one on that, I think. And a bunch of other guys have videos on it that really illustrate like little animated movies. Like, oh, here's what happens. You, you, you. When you add in these little, you know, relus together, how they can make anything. Yeah. It's a very neat result. Yeah, oh, what, this what, cool. Yeah. What, when you have hundreds of thousands or millions of parameters, you can get pretty, pretty flexible. Yeah, these that's things. Right. That's right. Yeah. One one last thing that I uh, that I would make uh, I remarked that a couple of last remarks were for for chapter for sorry for lesson three in case you go through it is to really look into this quadratic function under the hood example um, because this really tells you that gradient descent is is you know it's not very automatic you have to you have to tinker with it a bit you might want to consider changing the loss function here uh and there's a lot of discussion about uh about loss functions what what makes a good loss function and what makes a good metric i think those things are very important to talk about essentially you don't want to you don't want you, you want a loss function that allows you to identify uh minima Okay. And you don't want flat surfaces. So that's essentially the idea here. So, uh, but you you see here that even for this under the hood, simple example, gradient descent is not doing very well. And this is, there's no stochastic part here yet. Yeah. So that's something. Yeah, to I'm surprised that you couldn't get that to better fit the quadratic. I mean, I got to fit the quadratic very well uh, using this. I mean, it should be certainly possible. I don't know whether it's just something weird with what you're doing or what he did here. But... Uh, Ah, really? You were able to get the the full quadratic? Yeah, I mean, and it shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, you're minimizing the uh -huh. loss, and if you minimize the loss and you go downhill, yeah. you should eventually get there. So that, it, that that's why I was surprised because you might have to uh, take with uh, the learning uh, rate, as you called it. But yeah, um, so that I I was surprised by that actually. So that's why I I bring it up. Uh, so I I would be curious how you were able to <laughs> to get it. <laughs> Well, you just gotta do more steps. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes smaller change of turn. Like you can I, do like 20 steps and reduce the learning rate. And there's you can actually there's a yeah. the learners that Torch has, PyTorch has automatically do these things where adjust the learning rate using momentum yeah. and you know weight mm -hmm. decay and and you know, or you can put in little learning rate schedulers, but in this case you just do it by hand, like you know, do 20 epochs with uh, one learning rate, then make it smaller and then work your way into the, <laughs> the area. Yeah. yeah. I, I did 10,000 epochs, but I was I was stuck. Yeah, but so. see, at some point, your learning is too high, just bouncing around at the bottom great. of the That's, thing, and you're not but, even going to get there. Yeah. yeah. So you have to reduce uh, the learning rate to start. Once you like bounce, get to the lower part, you got to reduce right. the learning rate so you can then work your way down and keep low, reducing your learning rate. If you if you have that uh, sweet spot, let, let and that's what like the atom yeah. optimizer and various other optimizers yeah. in yeah. PyTorch do this automatically. They I figure see. out like what the learn they yeah. adaptively figure out what the learning rate should see. be based on how much the gradient is changing. So just using a fixed learning rate is is generally not used because yeah. it does not work very well. As you found out. And another another thing is the uh when you look at under the hood, they talk about L one norms. But it's essentially the implementation were well, was about uh, L two, so might be interesting to look at uh, what the L one version of things would look like. But L one loss, you mean? But yeah, yeah. 
There's, they're not doing any any uh, regularization yet here. They will later, but no, no, for the loss function itself, not the yeah, regular yeah. yeah. but for the yeah. for the loss function yeah. itself. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you said norm. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there. I don't think it will really matter in this one because no. most of the data seem to be on the, close to the curve. It wouldn't matter because we only got two parameters. <laughs> or three yeah. parameters, sorry. Three parameters, yeah. yeah. You don't yeah. have any outliers. Yeah. <laughs> so you could you could try it. Uh for, for me it didn't work very well. I didn't go through any other optimizer, just the one that that they have there. Yeah. Hmm. I'll try okay. it. I need to run more code. That's my <laughs> I've calculated a lot of this stuff by hand. I need to go the like I said, I need to find the paper and pencil that I'm gonna draw my circles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is tough, especially like you know, you you boot you, you, you go to you know, let's say using paper space, you go there. On a Monday, and all their servers are busy. It's like you picked up your pencil, and there's no lead in it. You know, it's like, what do you yeah. think? <laughs> <laughs> it's very frustrating. Paper space works great. I use it quite a bit, but like sometimes, like especially on the weekends or on Mondays, uh, you know, once a month, it seems to me that they've got some problem where they got downtime and things aren't working. And I think because they just got recently got bought by uh, DigitalOcean, and I don't know if there's some growing pains there or what, but. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks, Andrew. Next week, we're skipping for um, American no. yeah. holiday. <laughs> um, okay. I will be out of the country for the next three weeks, huh? so I may or may not join. Ron, you might need okay. to be a backup facilitator. No worries. Um, but I signed up for one um, when I get back. So I think that's all the yeah, housekeeping. I'll, I'll put end.